the two halves of our department here. Uh, and um, Jason is uh, uh, has is actually a secret secret Canadian imposter <laughs> in American astrophysics. He's taking over American astrophysics these days. He's been in recently won the uh, Pierce Prize for young uh, young astronomer in by the WAS, which is given to one young astronomer every year under the age of 36. Um, and uh, he's also the JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, which is the next generation space telescope project scientist at Space Telescope, where he's a staff scientist. Um, and um, Jason's going to be telling us about uh, his work on white dwarf stars. He also has done really interesting work on uh, nearby galaxies uh, and solar populations in Andromeda um, and work on the initial mass function of stars. Um, he has really broad uh, research interests. Uh, and um, he did his all his schooling at UBC uh, through a PhD in uh, University of British Columbia, and then did a, uh, was a Hubble Fellow at uh, at, Santa, at UC Santa Cruz, um, and then became a staff member at the Space Telescope Science Institute, where he is right now. Okay. Oh, actually, just one more thing is that he's going to be giving a talk about the James Webb Space Telescope tomorrow at 10.30 in the INSCC Auditorium, if you're interested as well. Don't miss it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So just to put this... So the James... Anil's got me started now. So the James Webb Space Telescope is the, is the biggest federally funded research program happening in the country. So it's a, it's a really big deal. And for the future of astrophysics, we have to get it right. So tomorrow I'll highlight some of the science potential of the telescope and, as well as its current status. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some science. Um, I've been working on um, stellar astrophysics and the evolution of stars uh, since I started graduate school. And one of the types of stars that I enjoy working on a lot are white dwarf stars. Uh, white dwarf stars are essentially the end product of stellar evolution for the majority of stars that form in the universe. And uh, they're remarkably simple objects and they can tell us a lot about the life cycles of stars and how stars change over time. And that is a, a you know, core input that we need for, for many important relations in, in astrophysics. And so I'm going out on a bit of a limb here. And Neil told me that there's a lot of condensed matter physicists in this uh, department. So I'm going out on, a, on a bit of a limb here. And we'll see how far I get before it breaks. Um, <laughs> uh, I have lots of collaborators to thank. Uh, this is a group that's been working together on these projects for, um, for about 10 years, most of them, uh, especially Harvey Richer, who I did my PhD with at the University of British Columbia. And so let me start with uh, um, a quick outline. So what I want to do uh, initially is just to give you some history on the observational discovery of white dwarf stars and some of the surprises that they, they, that they posed earlier. Um, also motivate why we should care about such stars. We have lots of different types of stars in the universe. Why are white dwarfs so unique? Why do we, why do we want to study them? Um, and then I'll talk about what white dwarfs can tell us about the process by which stars evolve. <coughs> what the importance is uh, for stellar evolution, for understanding a broad range of astrophysics. One of the biggest difficulties that happens uh, in th that's, uh, that we don't understand for stellar evolution is how much mass a star loses through its life. Uh, after the hydrogen burning main sequence phase where stars spend the majority of their lives, they begin to expand and they begin to lose mass. And depending on how much mass they lose, you completely impact the, the future evolution of that star. Uh, so to put this in perspective as an analogy, if we took the sun today and we represented it as a soccer ball, the sun will grow to be as big as the soccer field that the soccer ball is on, and then shrink to be as big as an ant that's walking <coughs> on that soccer ball. So stars go through these dynamic, diverse changes over short periods of, li uh, of their lifetimes, and we have to understand those if we want to correctly predict that, that evolution. And so we've developed a new technique that attempts to simultaneously find stars in the two parts of their evolution where we do understand them well. The hydrogen burning main sequence phase, where stars are in a state of equilibrium, they're converting hydrogen into helium, they're not changing uh, over time very much, and their final end state of stellar evolution is white dwarfs. And so there's a process, a prescription that we've developed to actually uh, find this, and I'll go through each of these steps in detail. And then finally, I'll end by just talking about one new application that we've, uh, that we've done from, from this research uh, to measure very accurate ages for some of the oldest stellar populations in the Milky Way galaxy, and in effect, tell us what the age of our, our galaxy is. 
So let me start with some history on white dwarfs and show uh, this nice <coughs> image of a, a part of the night sky uh, showing the Orion constellation. Everybody's looked up and seen this. There's the three stars in the belt of Orion. And so the brightest star in this picture, and in fact the brightest star in the night sky, is this star down here, uh, which is called Sirius. Um, so Sirius is a couple parsecs away. It's one of the nearest stars to the sun. Um, it's a star that's a couple times the mass of, the, of, uh, of our sun. So it's a little bit more luminous, probably about you know, uh, 10 or 20 times more luminous than the sun. I forget the exact number. And so it was recognized very early on that, Sir, that there's something strange about Sirius, that the path that Sirius follows in the night sky as you observe it given the Earth's orbit is, um, is not what you expect, that Sirius is apparently doing a little wobble in the sky. And this was seen in the 1840s, and it was inferred a decade or two decades after that, that Sirius must have a companion star. And the motion that we're seeing is the motion of the primary star the brighter star around the center of mass of that binary. And so people suspected this back in, uh, back in the you know, late 1800s. And the optical detection of that companion star didn't actually occur until 1862. Sorry, mid-1800s didn't actually occur until 1862. Um, so here's a modern day picture of Sirius and its little companion star. It's two pictures, one here from Lick Observatory, one here from Chandra showing the two stars. We know today that these two stars are orbiting each other in a 50-year orbit. Um, and that tells you, knowing the properties of Sirius A, it tells you what the properties are of the companion star. And surprisingly, this companion star, uh, according to the dynamics of the system, has a mass of one solar mass. So it has the same mass as the sun. Uh, but its luminosity is much, much lower. Its luminosity is 300 times lower than the luminosity of the sun. And Sirius A is much brighter than the sun, so the luminosity ratio of these two stars is, a, is quite large. To first order, it was inferred that the colors of the two stars are similar. And so for that luminosity ratio, that the colors are, are similar, that means that the temperatures are about the same. That implies that the radius of uh, Sirius B is about 1 one hundredth the radius of Sirius A. And so this is a star that has the mass of the sun, but its radius is 100 times smaller than the mass of the sun. And that means that its density is going to be about a million times larger than the density of Earth. And so this posed a, a puzzle. Um, in the 19, uh, early 1900s, a spectrum was measured for the companion star. It was shown that that spectrum is white, implying that it's a hot star, right? If you see a, a low mass uh, a star that's as faint as Sirius B, you naturally infer that it's a low mass hydrogen burning star. But this, uh, this confirmed that it's a, it's a hot star and not a cool star. A gravitational redshift was also measured for the photons escaping off the surface of uh, Sirius B. And that, again, confirmed the fact that this star has a huge surface gravity, that it's a, it's a massive star. And so this was the first known white dwarf. Uh, white dwarf is the dense remnant of a hydrogen burning star that has exhausted its nuclear fuel. So all of the hydrogen reactions that are happening in stars are happening in their cores. After the stellar envelope is blown away, it's only that core that's left over, and that core is very dense, and we call it a white dwarf star. And so one interesting part about these two images is that the, the temperatures of these two stars are actually not the same. Sirius B is a relatively young white dwarf, and therefore it's, it's still a pretty hot white dwarf, has a temperature of about 20,000 Kelvin. And so in this optical image, Sirius A is shown as the, as the bright star, and Sirius B is the, is the faint star. But in this Chandra X-ray image, Sirius B, the white dwarf, is actually the bright star. And Sirius A, the cooler star, is the smaller star. So, um, so a little bit more on, so that's the discovery of Sirius A and B. But almost immediately after the discovery of this white dwarf, it became clear that this white dwarf was going to be very important for tracking the process by which stars evolve and die. And so pop quiz for the astronomers in the audience, who are these two? No? When is Eitingen? Sorry? Eitingen? Eddington? Eddington? No. no. Oh, no, that, that one's that's Planck, right? Planck, no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how many physicists we can get through. <laughs> All right, so this is Hertzsprung and Russell. Uh, Stellar evolution, come on, guys. <laughs> okay? And, uh, and this is this is the. Yeah, <laughs> this is Hertzsprung and Russell. Look, it says. Uh, oh, yeah, that proves everything. <laughs> so, and this is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. 
This isn't just any color magnitude diagram. This is the first one. And so the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is a very simple diagram that plots the spectral type of stars, or in other words, their temperature, against their luminosity. And Hertzsprung, in the early 1900s, had noticed something uh, remarkable. He looked at a set of stars that were nearby stars, and he measured their parallaxes. So he knew what the distances to the stars were, and he measured their spectral types. So he basically looked at what wavelength of light they're emitting most of their flux at. And for some stars that had the same parallax and had the same spectral type, so these are two stars now that are at the same distance, right? At the same distance, and they have the same spectral type, he found very different luminosities. He saw stars that were down here and stars that were up here. And so Hertzsprung in his paper in 1908, coins the term giants and dwarfs to describe these two types of stars that he's measuring. A little bit later, Henry Norris Russell comes up and uh, makes more accurate measurements and actually fills the luminosity temperature plane with, uh, with a number of nearby stars. These are the same stars that you can see with, the, with your naked eye in the, in the night sky. And, um, and the paper that Henry Norris Russell wrote uh, begins to make the first predictions on the process of stellar evolution, suggesting that stars are actually moving across this plane, and we're looking at stars that are at different uh, life stages. Now, there was one star that Hertzsprung and Russell both questioned on this diagram. They thought something was very wrong, um, and, and this star must be contaminated. And that's this star sitting right here. This star is sitting all by itself. It has no companions. It's very hot, uh, and it's not uh, luminous. And so this is one of the nearest stars to the sun. It's a system called 40 Eridani. One of the reasons that they suspected that this star was contaminated, that the spectral type of this star must be contaminated, i.e. that it must be sitting over here, is that it has a bright neighbor. And it's actually three stars. It's a three star system. So there's a bright star here, which is a K dwarf. And then there's a binary that's orbiting that K dwarf. And that binary consists of an M dwarf and a white dwarf. Okay, So it's a triple system. And this is a very important system in science fiction as well. It's 40 Eridani. Uh, 40 Eridani B was the host star for the planet Vulcan in Star Trek. <laughs> okay, so why should we care about these white dwarfs? And so Hertzsprung and Russell at the time thought this was a mistake. There must be something wrong with this data point. But it turns out that in the first Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, there were hints of the process of stellar evolution through this measurement. So why do we care about this? So first of all, the process of star formation creates stars in a, in a way that 98% of all stars will end their lives in this state. 98% of all stars will exhaust their, their envelopes, not blow up as supernovae, but instead form uh, white dwarfs. These stars have no nuclear fuel left. They've exhausted all of their gas. And therefore, as a function of time, all they can do is cool and become dimmer as time passes. They just radiate away their stored thermal energy into space and they become dimmer. And so that means by simply measuring the luminosity of one of these stars, you can infer how old it is. So they can be used as clocks. They also have um, signatures imprinted on them of that integrated stellar evolution that happens before a star lands on the white dwarf sequence. Um, and they can provide unique insights on stellar thresholds, such as the, the mass at which a star decides to become a white dwarf. If it doesn't become a white dwarf, it, it blows up as a type 2 supernova, which is very important for understanding energetics and galaxies. OK, so let me move on to part two of the talk, understanding stellar evolution by using white dwarfs. And let me start by motivating, uh, motivating this study. So let me show you an image of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is the most famous image that we have in astronomy. It's a view of what the universe looks like through a tiny region of sky. And if you asked anybody, what is this an image of? What's this image showing? Uh, it doesn't have to be an astronomer or a physicist. It could be somebody in the public. They'll look at this and they'll say it's an image of galaxies. right? Uh, to me, this has always been an image of starlight. What we're seeing here are stars in these systems that are near the tip of their evolution, that are shining appreciably in different wave bands. And that's what gives us the beautiful color that we see in this image. And so much of astronomy today is concerned with interpreting images like this. It's concerned with taking this image and trying to figure out uh, what is the blue light telling us about the star formation histories, about the chemical abundance histories of these galaxies, the mass to light ratios? What is the red light telling us? If we want to understand uh, those questions and actually interpret light from the universe, we have to be able to understand how stars are evolving when they go through these dynamic changes, when they become very bright and, uh, and luminous and, and both cool and hot depending on their evolutionary properties. And so you can take a look at this image, and you can actually look at it 
as a superposition of many Hertzsprung Russell diagrams. This is a simulation from Julianne Dalcatton showing what a range of stellar populations would look like on the Hertzsprung Russell diagram as a function of very different ages. So the red stars that you see in this diagram are stars that have ages of 10 million years or 20 million years. The dark stars that you see here, black stars, are, are stars that have ages of 3 to 5 billion years. So the hydrogen burning stars are sitting way down here in the case of old stellar populations. And everything that you see in the bright part of this diagram are individual stars that are evolving in different phases of post-main sequence evolution after they've exhausted that hydrogen in their core. So for example, you get bright red stars, which are called red giant branch stars and asymptotic giant branch stars. These are just names that astronomers use. You can have core helium burning stars that are very, uh, very blue. Um, and then you can also have hot hydrogen burning main sequence stars, stars that are very young that haven't had a chance to exhaust their hydrogen. So the red light in this image that we see is caused by stars that are evolving on the red giant branch phase and the asymptotic giant branch, luminous phases where you're burning shells of hydrogen around the core. The blue stars that you see in, that, in the absence of any uh, recent star formation are stars that are burning uh, helium in their cores. And then in the cases of spiral galaxies like the Milky Way, where you see a lot of young star forming regions, you have to understand the phase of hot, uh, more massive hydrogen burning main sequence stars. So in general, the, the, the major goal of my research is to calibrate this diagram, understand these relations, the time scales of stellar evolution, the luminosities that stars reach at fixed conditions such as metallicity, so that we can interpret light better in the universe. Okay? So the problem occurs um, on the first phase. So as soon as stars run out of hydrogen, stars begin to ascend the red giant branch, and they begin to lose a little bit of mass. This mass loss depends on a lot of different things. It depends on the luminosity of the stars. It depends on the velocity of the envelope of the stars, um, the composition of the dust. You can get dredge up episodes where the envelope mixes with the core of the star and kicks up carbon and oxygen, increases the opacity of the envelope, and you get more mass loss. You can, you can get uncertainties in the dust to gas ratio through those processes. All of these things feed into understanding that first ascent mass loss on the red giant branch. As I've said, this is very important for, for measuring the luminosity functions and time scales of this phase. Unfortunately, uh, we don't understand it very well. So here's a diagram showing several theoretical relations in the literature for the same type of star, an old low mass star, that starts to go up the red giant branch and lose mass. And these relations tell you how much mass it loses at a fixed metallicity. And what you see is that the predictions are all over the map. And so you can't really use these relations to accurately calibrate those models. And so what I try and do is put data points on, on these types of relations. And so how do we actually do this? Well, we exploit a trick to try and populate a relation that links the two phases of stellar evolution that we do understand well. We understand the hydrogen burning main sequence phase. That gives us our initial mass, okay? the initial mass of hydrogen burning stars. We can also understand the white dwarf cooling phase where stars are at their end states. That gives us the final mass of stars. And so the trick is to simultaneously measure stars <coughs> for which you know their final masses and for which you know their initial masses. Now that can be hard. Let's imagine we look up in the night sky and we grab a hydrogen burning main sequence star. We know its parallax. We can figure out its mass. But we have no way to link that mass to the final mass that that star will create at the end of its life. Similarly, some of the nearest stars to the, to the sun are white dwarfs. We can study those white dwarfs in detail, like Sirius B, but we have no way to figure out what the progenitor star properties were that made the white dwarf. So how do we actually put data on this plot? Well, we take advantage of the fact that in the universe, in our galaxy, we have remarkable populations called star clusters where a whole bunch of stars, 10,000 stars, hundreds of thousands of stars, form simultaneously at the same time with the same composition at the same place. And so the only thing that separates the stars in a star cluster are their mass. So by studying a star cluster, I can not only find those stars that are just exhausting their hydrogen supply today, giving me the initial mass, but I can find those stars that are forming white dwarfs today and actually link these two, these two phases of stellar evolution. So we designed a program that uh, contains three different steps uh, to measure this initial final mass relation. So the first phase is to do a photometric survey, to use uh, telescopes on the ground, image these star clusters, these stellar populations, 
and uncover white dwarfs, uncover these faint remnants in a large uh, number of star clusters um, with different ages. Okay, if the clusters have different ages, that means the masses of the stars that are evolving to form the white dwarfs today are different. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. The second step is to do a spectroscopic survey and take advantage of the fact that given the huge density on these white dwarf stars, they have a unique spectral signature. And we can model that spectral signature to infer what the physical properties of those stars are. And then the final step is to put this all together. You've got the age of the star cluster. You know how long the white dwarf has been cooling for. All of the, the stars in the cluster have the same age. And so you can infer what the main sequence lifetime and mass is of the progenitor star. So to give you an idea about this, say we have a star cluster that's, uh, that's 10 billion years old. And I, I measure from my spectroscopy that the white dwarf has been cooling for 3 billion years. That means that the star that made the white dwarf um, had to be 7 billion years at the time that it exhausted its hydrogen. So you can then, you can then get both of these values. So for step one, we use uh, large ground-based telescopes. This is a picture of the Canada-France Hawaii telescope on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's a great telescope. It's a four-meter telescope, uh, very nice sight. The telescope is perfect for, for high-precision photometry uh, of, of you know, nearby objects. One of the things that makes this telescope great is that it has a huge camera on it. Um, this is a camera that we call Megacam. Uh, it's a camera that uh, subtends an angular size of about one degree. So we can shoot one degree of the night sky simultaneously on a four meter telescope, which is a great capability. And so we've used this, uh, this telescope and this camera to look at a number of star clusters with different ages. So these are all Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. Uh, I have color plotted here on the x-axis, which is the temperature and then luminosity on the vertical axis. And these are a little bit messy because these are actually open star clusters. These are young star clusters that are in the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. So when you look at these star clusters, you encounter a whole bunch of foreground stars. Then you hit your star cluster. And then after your star cluster, you hit a whole bunch of background stars. So these are, for example, the background stars. These are the foreground stars. And then this swath that you see cutting through the middle, those are the stars that belong to the star cluster. And so these are uh, five different star clusters, roughly at the same distance, give or take a factor of a few, but with very different ages. So in the case of NGC 6791, this is a star cluster that's 8 billion years old. And you can kind of tell that it's old because all of the, all of the more massive hydrogen burning main sequence stars that would be sitting on an extension of this sequence are gone. Those stars have evolved and 98% of them have formed white dwarfs. If we look at younger clusters, this is a cluster that has an age of 2.5 billion years, 1.5 billion years. The main sequences, the hydrogen burning sequence gets longer and longer. So you can begin, and, and the key here is for the first time in the study of these star clusters, our photometry is faint enough that we pick up a large population of faint blue objects, some of which are white dwarfs from that earlier evolution in the cluster's history. Okay? Most of the previous studies of these star clusters truncate at a bright enough magnitude or have large enough photometric uncertainties uh, in, at these faint luminosities that you don't pick up those white dwarfs, those remnants. So you can begin to see how we're going to get this initial final mass relation. If we take a look at NGC 6791, I know based on the age of the star cluster that the stars that are evolving today from the hydrogen burning main sequence have a mass of about one solar mass, about 1.1 solar masses. So if I find a bright white dwarf in the star cluster, that bright white dwarf had to come from a star that was just a little bit more massive than one solar mass. Right? If I go to a younger cluster like NGC 6819, Stars that are evolving in this cluster have a turnoff mass of about one and a half solar mass. And so these are white dwarfs that evolved from stars just above one and a half solar masses. And if you move in, move down the diagram, you begin to probe stellar evolution for more and more massive stars. So let's take a look at NGC 2168 here on the right hand side. This cluster has an age of 200 million years. That means even a five solar mass star hasn't had enough time to exhaust its hydrogen supply. If I find a white dwarf in this star cluster, that white dwarf had to come from a star that was more massive than five solar masses. Otherwise, the star should still be burning hydrogen on the main sequence. Make sense? OK, good. Question? How do you decouple this measurement from all, let me ask that another way. How do you get the age of this cluster, and then how do you get the age of these clusters, and then make this measurement separate from these populations? Yeah, so what you do to get the age of the, of the clusters is this is one of the things that we understand about stellar evolution really well, is how the hydrogen burning main sequence is going to change as a function of time. 
So we use models. These are models that are calibrated on the sun. All of these stars have a metallicity that's very similar to the sun. And we fit a model to the luminosity of the point that, that, uh, that uh, corresponds to when hydrogen uh, is exhausted. So we can fit a model and get the ages of these star clusters to about 5 to 10% accuracy at a given distance. Okay, and, that, and that's totally decoupled from the number of stars that have turned off and gone to their white dwarf phase. It is. Right. So it's totally decoupled from the luminosity function that's right. leading to the white dwarfs. Okay? The, the age is just coming from where that truncation, where that turnover is. Okay. Okay. So basically you know, for example, that this is just a luminosity, right? You know that a five solar mass star is going to have this luminosity. If the luminosity of the star that's still burning hydrogen is way down here, then that means that that population has to have evolved to that age. I'll actually show you an example of a model fit later in the talk. Okay. To one of these. Yeah. So another point is that you know, the evolution from the twelve point to the bedrock you know, phase that's really short. It's really it's tiny. Point. Exactly. Good point. So that so the reason that and we actually know what it is and we account for it, but if this star, the once a star leaves the turnoff, it goes through all of these different phases in an insignificant amount of time and lands on the white dwarf cooling sequence. But we actually take it into account anyways. Okay. Oh, sorry, I hit the back button too much. Okay. So the second step. So with the first step, now we've got ages for a bunch of star clusters, and we have white dwarf candidates identified. We don't actually know which ones are the white dwarfs. Some of these can be background galaxies or other faint blue contaminants that are not real white dwarfs. And so the second step of our survey is to do a spectroscopic survey now of the white dwarf candidates, confirm which ones are in fact uh, white dwarfs, and then measure their detailed properties. Okay? And so we've been allocated uh, about 20 nights of, of Keck 1 time over the last seven, eight years uh, to do this survey. So Keck-1 is a 10-meter telescope, also on the summit of Mauna Kea. It's got one of the hottest blue spectrographs in the world. Um, the way that we do this is to use a mode called multi-object spectroscopy. So a multi-object spectroscopy is spectroscopy where you can target multiple stars simultaneously by taking a physical mask, a sheet of metal, that's mounted in your, in your instrument, and that sheet of metal blocks out light from all of the bright stars in the star cluster and only allows the light from the faint remnants that you're trying to study or the candidates that you find most interesting. And then it disperses their light uh, across the, the, a different direction. And so you can look at 20, 30 objects simultaneously using this mode. Okay. So the reason that this technique works so well for these natural condensed matter laboratories, stars uh, you know, like white dwarfs, is that white dwarfs have a unique spectral signature. So here's a little cartoon showing the spectrum of three different types of stars. We've got the sun at the top here, and this is basically the optical part of the spectrum. Then we've got a white dwarf and a blue giant. So the white dwarf and the blue giant both have about the same temperature. These are A-type stars, uh, 20,000, 25,000 Kelvin. Both of these stars have thin atmospheres, and those atmospheres have a little bit of hydrogen. On the surface of a white dwarf, the, the mass of the atmosphere is 10 to the minus 4 solar masses. So it's a tiny, tiny, thin atmosphere. But that atmosphere is what imprints the spectral signatures that we detect from that uh, white dwarf. So in the case of a blue giant, given its temperature, the spectrum that we see is the spectrum of the hydrogen atom. And so these are just the bomber lines, H alpha, H beta, mm -hmm. H gamma, H delta, etc. In the white dwarf, we see the exact same bomber lines. But because the surface gravity of a white dwarf is so high, <coughs> those bomber lines are pressure broadened. Okay? Those bomber lines experience a Stark effect. Neighboring atoms in the white dwarf can feel perturbations. And so the bomber lines end up being broadened. <laughs> to put a sense of scale on this, in the case of a blue giant, these bomber lines have equivalent widths of 5 or 10 angstroms. In the case of a white dwarf, they're going to be 70 to 100 angstroms. So the bomber lines are very, very broad. So here's an example from my postdoc of what the spectrum of three hypothetical white dwarfs looks like at three different temperatures, 15,000, 25,000, and 35,000 Kelvin. And he stacked the, the five bomber lines, H beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, eight, for a given white dwarf on top of one another, just so you can see how these bomber lines are going to change as a function of temperature. So you can easily get temperature from measuring the depths of these lines. More importantly, you can also measure the surface gravity. So I'm going to show now uh, a spectrum of stars with the exact same temperatures, but with a different surface gravity. This is a surface gravity of log g equals 7. This would be a low mass white dwarf. 
Here's what the spectrum looks like for a white dwarf with log g equals 8, which would be a typical white dwarf that we find in the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. You can see that the low order lines like H beta become pressure broadened even more. You're adding a little bit more mass on top of a white dwarf. Remember the star is supported by degenerate electron pressure. Perturbations between the neighboring atoms are increasing a little bit. Stark effect is larger, so these lines get a little bit broader. If we increase the mass even more, so say we go to a star like Sirius B, a one solar mass white dwarf, a pretty heavy white dwarf, uh, there what you see is that the low order lines get even broader. But at the same time, if you look up at the high order lines, you see that as we've been tweaking the mass of the star up, the high order lines are destroyed. So these high order lines represent you know, energy levels in the atom, outer energy levels in the atom. And so as you increase these perturbations, those are going to be the first ones to be destroyed. So if you can observe a white dwarf spectroscopically and simultaneously measure the low order lines and the high order lines, you can break any of the degeneracies that you have between temperature and gravity and constrain both uh, very accurately. And this is a technique that's been cross-checked against independent methods. So for example, white dwarfs that are in binaries like Sirius, you've got an astrometric mass from its orbit around Sirius A. Uh, white dwarf, somewhat, you know, dozens of white dwarfs have gravitational redshift measurements. And over an appreciable range of temperature that includes sort of this range here, all of these values agree well with one another to you know, a few percent accuracy. So my postdoc is currently involved in, in trying to take this work to the next level. The way that we're modeling these white dwarfs uh, right now is, um, <clears throat> is based on uh, 1D models. What he's doing now is generating uh, 3D radiation hydrodynamic simulations of a white dwarf. This is the first simulation that he's created, which was published this year. Um, so this is actually showing you uh, convection in the white dwarf. And so you can see the surface. This is what the surface of the white dwarf looks like. These are real units of time there. You have to slow this down. So this is how the surface of a white dwarf would be changing over the course of about a second. Um, the convection in this star is about the same as the sun, except the time scales are sped up because the surface gravity is much, much larger. So that's what the surface looks like. You can see the temperature structure on the left here, some flowing particles here uh, at the bottom. Uh, the size of this box is about seven kilometers across in, in his simulation. So. Sorry, sorry, interrupted you. Uh, when you say hydrodynamic simulation, do you mean like solution of Navier Stokes equations? Or? I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. He started working with me three months ago, and so I'm, I'm showing his work. That's the paper, but I don't know the details. Yeah. Right. This is well removed from my field of yeah. expertise. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, so what he's doing now is taking these 3D simulations and generating theoretical spectra uh, based on these simulations and then fitting those to, to observations. Uh, when he does this, for the, the first set of spectra that he's fit, he's getting uh, much tighter air constraints on the, on the observations. And for lower temperatures, where the bomber line method with the 1D models previously wasn't working, not, not the regime that I'm talking about, but if you go down to 10,000, 11,000 Kelvin, he's finding good agreement between the 3D models and the, and the independent data points uh, in those regions. So these models look promising, and we're looking forward to applying them to, to a large range of observations that we have. Is there an explanation why there's like a slight, I guess there's a higher density just below the surface and it also corresponds to a cooler area, cooler band at the same location? I'm sure there is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know if you knew I don't that know. much from the paper. No, I don't, I don't know. Sorry. This is actually hot off the press. This was just published. So I haven't actually read the paper either. <laughs> be honest with you guys. OK, so let me show you some data. That's the stuff that I do know about. <laughs> so here's, uh, here's the faintest, lowest signal-to-noise spectra that we've collected, uh, white dwarfs. This took multiple nights on the Keck telescope. This is now a globular star cluster, a very massive, dense region. Um, so shown on the left-hand side here is uh, a color magnitude diagram, this time that was put together by the Hubble Space Telescope. And so here you can see a very clean detection of the cooling white dwarfs in the star cluster going down to very low luminosities. All of the hydrogen burning stars are sitting up here. And then on the right, you see six spectra where we've stacked the bomber lines for each of those white dwarfs on top of one, uh, one another. And then the red line is a simultaneous fit to those bomber lines, the output of which is the temperature and the gravity of these stars. So the final step is to put this all together. We've got the properties of the star cluster. We've got the properties of the white dwarfs. So we can infer what the initial masses and the final masses are. <coughs> so if we take our relation here, this is, again, you know, one of the most fundamental relations in stellar astrophysics, initial mass versus final mass. 
let's start putting the data points on here. And I'll explain the dash line in a minute. So here's what the data set looked like as of about 2005. And so these were all of the data points that we had on this initial final mass relation. Uh, more than half of the individual data points in here come from our study in 2005. Uh, but what I've done here is bin these up to represent each star cluster as a single data point instead of showing you, uh, you know, it would get very messy if I showed all of the individual measurements because some of these clusters have 15, 20 white dwarfs in them. So what this tells us is that more massive hydrogen burning main sequence stars as we go up from about three solar masses up to six solar masses are making more massive white dwarfs. Unfortunately, we can't use this relation to do a lot of the exciting astrophysics that I talked about at the start, interpreting light from the universe, because the mass function creates many more low mass stars than high mass stars. So if we just created a bunch of stars, uh, most of them would have low masses and not high masses. So this represents a very tiny sliver of the overall mass distribution that, that is created by the process of star formation. And so over the last few years, we've been focused on completing this relation down to the lowest masses by targeting older star clusters that are making lower mass white dwarfs. And so this is what our latest initial final mass relationship looks like now. Shows that this trend of, uh, of lower mass main sequence stars making lower mass white dwarfs continues all the way down. For the first time, we have an initial final mass relation that extends right from stars that are like the sun, one solar mass, all the way up to uh, six solar mass stars. So a summary of our results on this uh, initial final mass relation tells us that Low mass stars like the sun will lose about 46% of their mass through stellar evolution. These are the kind of the bold predictions I can make as an astronomer. So the sun will end its life as a 0.54 solar mass star. I can get a couple citations for that in about 6 billion years. <laughs> Intermediate mass stars with masses of a few solar masses are going to lose 70 to 75% of their mass. So they blow away pretty much uh, you know, 3 quarters of their mass. And then very high mass stars with five, six solar masses are going to lose about 80% of their mass through stellar evolution. One of the mysteries that we have here is, <coughs> many of you probably know the work of Chandrasekhar, which uh, told us that the, that the most massive white dwarf that we can form is going to be about 1.4 solar masses. If you look at this initial final mass relation, the most massive data point that we have on this relation is sitting at a mass of about 1.05 solar masses. And so there's this fundamental threshold in stellar astrophysics where at some point a star decides whether or not it's going to blow up as a type 2 supernova or if it's going to lose mass quiescently and form a white dwarf. And we all learned in Astro 101 that that threshold mass is about 8 solar masses. So a star more massive than 8 solar masses is going to make a type 2 supernova. Less massive is going to make a white dwarf. That 8 solar masses comes from a, a, an extrapolation of an old initial final mass relation up to the Chandrasekhar mass. So imagine you had a few data points here on some old initial final mass relation. You push, you just extrapolate it up to the Chandrasekhar mass, and then you read off what your initial mass is. You get eight solar masses. If you take my relation and you extrapolate it up, you'll get about nine, nine and a half solar masses. Why haven't we found them? So part of this is probably an observational bias. If you want to detect stars that are, say, seven solar mass stars on this relation, you have to have a very young star cluster that's maybe 30 million years or 20 million years where a seven solar mass star wouldn't have evolved. But it also has to be a very rich star cluster because if the star cluster has 200 stars in it, you're not going to make a seven solar mass star because most stars are low mass stars. So you need to find a very rich, uh, <coughs> young, nearby star cluster. And so one of our research projects that, that a different postdoc um, at Johns Hopkins University is doing with me is to push this relation up. And so we've actually identified a number of these young clusters that we think are going to be good candidates for this study. And we've applied for time on a, on a it's in southern hemisphere clusters on the southern hemisphere telescope. Our proposal's been accepted. And so we're looking forward in the next couple of years to try and extend this relation up and say something about what that threshold mass is through a direct measurement instead of the, the extrapolations that we've done so far. So, you, so <coughs> there are simple like, physical reasons why you know, this relation becomes Know, steeper, become really steep and uh, to what, to five solar mass? Yeah, there is. So, so I haven't explained what the dash line is. So the, um, the dash line here is, so, so remember at the start I said it's very hard to predict mass loss through the red giant branch and the asymptotic giant branch. It's tough to do it. We don't understand the physical processes. The one thing that we can predict reliably is what the mass of the core of the star is through that evolution. We don't know what's happening in the envelope. That's where the mass loss is happening. But we do understand the core up to a certain point. 
And that point is when the core lands on the asymptotic giant branch. The asymptotic giant branch is the phase of stellar evolution that happens right after the core helium burning phase, after which the star begins to burn helium in its atmosphere. And so this dash relation is telling you a theoretical prediction, a model, <coughs> for what the core mass of a star is when the star lands on the asymptotic giant branch. What happens to a star after it goes up the AGB? Um, the star begins to burn helium in its uh, surroundings. It begins to lose mass and blow off its envelope. And the core begins to grow as the star goes up the uh, asymptotic giant branch. The core will continue to grow until the entire envelope of the star is expelled. Once the envelope of the star is expelled, uh, then that evolution is truncated. And you just have the core left. The entire envelope is gone. That core is the white dwarf. So the fact that all of the white dwarf, and this is a relation from 2000, from Leo Girardi 2000, has nothing to do with the data points. But the fact that all of the data points sit above the dash line is very reassuring because you expect that the core should grow as the star goes up the AGB. So this dash line is telling you what the core should be at the base of the AGB, and the data points are showing you the white dwarf masses, which is the core at the end of the AGB. And so the delta, to answer your question, sorry, this is a very long explanation, the delta, the difference that you have between the, the dash line and the, and the data points is telling you how much the core grows on the AGB. And so we have a new paper in, in 2013 that's available on AstroPH. It's not in uh, print yet. That tells you that the core grows very, uh, you know, doesn't grow at all for these low masses, grows a lot for these intermediate masses, and then, we're, and then again, doesn't, doesn't grow very much for these high masses. So part of the slope that you're seeing in here is caused by that, that core mass growth. Now, in the case of, you know, just to expand on this a little bit more, in the case of very massive white dwarfs, when we get up to white dwarfs that are one solar mass or 0.9 solar masses, it's also possible that the core composition of the remnant itself is different. That uh, instead of having a carbon-oxygen core, which is the byproduct of those helium-burning reactions, we could have magnesium cores, neon core stars. And so some of the slope changes that you see at the upper mass end might be caused by some transition in what the core composition of a white dwarf is at, at high masses. OK, so the punchline of my, of my research program is we, we finally have this initial final mass relation. Um, it tells us that uh, more massive stars are making more massive white dwarfs, but we can actually parameterize it. This is extremely useful in astrophysics because now any time you're making a simulation of a stellar population and you want that stellar population to evolve, Say you want to figure out how much mass that stellar population is going to return to the interstellar medium. You want to find out what kind of chemical yields are going to be sprayed back into the, into the surroundings. You can take your initial mass function and you can integrate it through this initial final mass relation and get that output yield. So over the last few years, this relation has been used for a lot of uh, you know, very cool astrophysics. Figure out exactly what's happening with these beautiful planetary nebulae where stars are illuminating all of that mass that they lost through those post-main sequence evolutionary phases. Sometimes you have certain information about an interesting star that might have a planet around it, but you need to know what the progenitor properties are. You can get that. Uh, you can measure supernova rates, evolutions, try and figure out if the progenitor channels for making uh, different types of supernovae make sense. <clears throat> Some of the chemical evolution stuff that I talked about, which is required in simulations of how galaxies evolve. And then also ways to measure the initial mass function. Uh, if we take a look at an old stellar population, say the halo of the Milky Way galaxy, where all a, a lot of the, the, the more massive stars have evolved, only stars that are left burning hydrogen are the low mass stars. Uh, but what if we want to understand what that progenitor mass function was? Well, that progenitor mass function is now sitting on the white dwarf cooling sequence. And so if we can measure that white dwarf cooling sequence, we can backtrack it through the initial final mass relation and get the progenitor mass distribution, the primordial initial mass function. And this has been done as well. OK, so that's the first two parts of the talk. The final part here that I'll, that I'll go through in the next five minutes or so is to give you one new application from our team um, on using this relation to measure accurate ages for star clusters. <clears throat> so getting to one of the questions that was asked earlier, about how do we measure stellar ages for uh, these systems. So we have a couple different techniques that we can try to measure stellar ages. We can do astroseismology. The Kepler telescope has been great for this. Uh, we can do gyrochronology, where we try and link the rotation period of a star to its age. Um, we can look at chromospheric activity, how active the star is. In general, 
these uh, relations don't work well over a large range of stars. They especially don't work very well over uh, everybody's talking. So what's wrong? <laughs> I skipped the big scary one on purpose. <laughs> um, so a lot of these relations don't work uh, very well for um, for low mass stars. Um, these these are relations like chromospheric activity rotation that are very prominent in in certain types of stars like M dwarfs in the case of chromospheric activity, massive stars in the case of gyrochronology, but they don't work well for for sort of average stellar populations. So by far the most popular technique for measuring the age of a star cluster is to fit its main sequence turnoff with stellar models, as I sort of described earlier without showing an example of. This is a method that works remarkably well for intermediate mass and massive stars because a massive star's luminosity and temperature, the observables that we can, we can measure, change with age. Okay? But for a low mass old star, its, its luminosity and temperature doesn't change. If you have a 11 billion year old star versus a 12 billion year old star, it's pretty much the same brightness and it's pretty much the same color. And so this is showing you uh, how difficult it can be to measure the age of an old stellar population. These are four different stellar models at ages of 11 billion years, 12 billion years, 13 billion years, and 14 billion years. These models all, con and this is a zoomed in panel around the turnoff. These models all converge for red giant branch stars and for low mass hydrogen burning main sequence stars. The only place that they show a slight separation is at the main sequence turnoff. So using this technique, you can measure the ages of star clusters but in the cases of old star clusters, you can't do it very accurately. If you had very precise photometry and you trusted your models exquisitely well, maybe you could say what the age of a star cluster is to an accuracy of a couple billion years, even in the case of nearby Milky Way star clusters. These models also have a lot of, uh, you know, they depend on a lot of different uh, physical uh, uh, inputs, and we have to constrain those inputs, and not all of those things are, are uh, known very well. And so if you if you uh, apply it a different set of models, you can actually get sort of systematic changes in your inferred measurements. And so white dwarfs offer an alternate approach to measure the age of a star. <coughs> um, the reason for this, of course, is that a white dwarf has no more nuclear fuel. So by simply measuring its luminosity, we get a proxy for its age. And uh, we know that if the white dwarf has been cooling for, say, 10 billion years, then the population that it belongs to must be at least 10 billion years old. Uh, Advantages of this method I've already highlighted. Some of the disadvantages, well, these stars are very faint, right? They have no nuclear fuel, so they're very faint. Um, and also star clusters are very crowded. You have a lot of bright stars, hydrogen burning stars, red giants, and uh, so it can be hard to find the white dwarfs. If you could do it, however, um, the, the results look very encouraging. So this is a simulation of now the faint part of a, of a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram three different white dwarf cooling sequences at three different ages, 10 billion years, 11 and a half billion years, and 13 billion years. So we generate these simulations by taking our initial final mass relation, uh, taking, a, taking an initial mass function of stars, pushing it through our initial final mass relation and figuring out how the white dwarfs cool. And the important thing here is that the truncation point of the white dwarf cooling sequence gets fainter and fainter as the cluster gets older. It's exactly what you expect. The white dwarfs have had longer to cool, so they're dimmer on the color magnitude diagram. The difference between a 10 billion year population and a 13 billion year old population is more than a magnitude. That's a factor of brightness of about two and a half on the white dwarf cooling sequence. The equivalent difference on the main sequence turnoff was 0.1 magnitudes. So this is a much more sensitive technique to measure the age of the cluster. The problem is, is you have to find these white dwarfs. And so our group's been engaged in <coughs> three of the largest Hubble Space Telescope programs for stellar population work that have ever been allocated uh, to look at three of the nearest star clusters and measure their total remnant population, measure the complete white dwarf cooling sequence, and to derive the age of the star cluster. The most recent project was very challenging. It looked at the star cluster 47 Tuck, which has a distance that's about twice as far as the earlier clusters that we looked at. It's a very interesting study because this cluster is also somewhat metal rich relative to uh, most of the globular clusters in our Milky Way. And so there's a lot of controversy in the literature on what its age really is. There are a lot of findings that suggest it's old and some findings that suggest it's actually one of the younger clusters. Here's a picture from Hubble of the part of 47 Tuck that we looked at. So the center of the cluster is way over here somewhere. You can see the density dropping off over our small field of view with Hubble. 
<coughs> and here are some white dwarfs um, that are cooling, um, becoming dimmer as we go uh, in, this, in this arrangement. So one of the unique parts of this study is that <coughs> the star cluster 47 tuck that we're looking at, which is one of the nearest star clusters to the sun, happens to sit in the Milky Way galaxy in a region that has a large dwarf galaxy way out in the outskirts. So this is a population at, at um, 5 kiloparsecs, 4.5 kiloparsecs. This is a population at 60 kiloparsecs. So this is a population that's about halfway to the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. But this is a dwarf galaxy. Dwarf galaxies have large halos, so we're expecting some contamination in our 47 tuck hertzsprung russell diagram <coughs> from stars that belong to this dwarf galaxy. Here's the color magnitude diagram, or hertzsprung russell diagram, that we put together from the study. This is one of the deepest hertzsprung russell diagrams that's ever been created in astronomy. Um, this is going down to about 30th magnitude. So these are stars that are, that are you know, four or five billion times fainter than the faintest stars you could see with the naked eye. Um, there's the complete hydrogen burning main sequence of the star cluster going all the way down to 30th magnitude. If you look at the, the luminosities of these stars and you fit those same stellar evolution models, these are stars that have masses of about 0.09 solar masses. So they're about 10 times less massive than the sun. These are stars that are sitting right at the hydrogen burning limit. So stars lower mass than this wouldn't be able to burn hydrogen in their, in their cores. In the blue part of the diagram, you see the nice white dwarf cooling sequence from 47 Tuck. These white dwarfs also show the sharp hook to the blue. This is a hook that's been predicted in models for a long time because of uh, collisional induced absorption of molecular hydrogen in the atmosphere. Very cool white dwarfs. So these are stars that have temperatures of only like 4,000 Kelvin. You get this opacity effect. And then in the middle is the main sequence, the hydrogen burning main sequence of the background galaxy, the small Magellanic Cloud, behind the star cluster. And so this is the deepest probe of the stellar populations of the Magellanic Cloud as well. Okay, here's the, the punchline from, for, for why white dwarfs are so interesting. This is a simple plot where I've taken two of my star clusters um, and plotted them on the same diagram. Um, and the only thing that I've done here is I've adjusted the distance of these two clusters uh, just to remove that variable, because we know the distances of both clusters and they're different. When we get rid of them, we see that the hydrogen burning sequences don't look nothing alike. That's exactly what we expect because the metallicities of these clusters is very different, and physics on the hydrogen burning main sequence depends on knowing the metallicity. And so that's why the main sequence is hard to fit. Um, you know, it depends on a lot of these variables. The stellar remnants don't care. Right? In a white dwarf, all of the metals just sink, and their cooling is dictated by a single you know, hyd the hydrogen atom. And so it's very simple. And you can also see that the 47 tuck white dwarfs are truncating about a half a magnitude brighter than the NGC 6397 white dwarfs. And so we're able to measure the age of 47 tuck to a very small error bar, show definitely in a relative sense that it's much younger than the globular star cluster NGC 6397. So my last plot is... Using this technique, we can begin to look at relations like the age metallicity relation of the Milky Way galaxy, but this time using a technique that doesn't actually depend on metals, because white dwarf cooling theory doesn't depend on metals. And we're starting to see hints here that more metal poor populations are in fact older, um, and there's some slope to this relation. If we can define this with, with higher resolution, it's uh, actually telling us a lot about the accretion processes that came in and populated our galaxy's halo, and how the buildup of the Milky Way galaxy actually occurred. So let me conclude. <coughs> um, white dwarfs are extremely interesting stars. They represent the end state of 98% of all stars. I showed you some spectra. These, these stars have unique spectral signatures given the intense pressure broadening on their surfaces. Um, these spectra can be modeled to shed light on their physical properties, like their temperatures, their gravities, their cooling ages. You can even get their theoretical luminosities from the spectrum. Um, they also lack nuclear energy sources, and they exhibit simple cooling as they age. Uh, by linking the properties of these white dwarfs to their progenitor stars, we're able to measure the initial final mass relation of stars, which tells us how much mass stars lose through their evolution, <coughs> greatly aids our, in our ability to interpret light from the universe. And then I highlighted um, one science case. I've posted two more up here, one that we talked about briefly, about uh, measuring the thermally pulsating asymptotic giant branch phase of stellar evolution. We're able to test different stellar evolution models, um, Claudia Maristone's models, Bruce Wall and Charlotte models, etc., and actually constrain uh, which of those are in line with our measurements for how much the core mass growth is on the AGB. 
We also published a paper in Nature last year establishing new techniques to, old, uh, to date old stellar populations uh, using white dwarfs, uh, sort of a unique, unique way of doing this. And then I showed that um, we can derive independent and accurate ages for Milky Way globular clusters using these stars. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We didn't learn enough about the uh, physical properties of the white dwarf. Their thermal transport, the density gradients, temperature gradients, and all kinds of stuff. Condensed stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right. I thought I went out on the limb enough, but I guess not. Um, so uh, yeah. So do you want to talk after? I mean, we could talk after uh, about this, right? I mean, there's. I mean, they're very interesting stars, right? Well, your, your postdoc is studying these things. My postdoc is a theorist, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so my postdoc is a student of the school at the University of Montreal that uh, that you know contains several of the of the world's experts on on modeling white dwarf properties, and so so absolutely. So he's you know he's an expert on the structure and the evolution of white dwarf stars, um, and understands these things like the back of his hand and talks about convective processes all day long. <laughs> um, and so he's a he's a great you know he's a great resource for those things. Well, must know something about the, the viscosity and all kinds of things. So it depends. So all, a lot of these things depend on what regime in the in the white dwarf's cooling uh, sequence you're looking at, right? So when these stars are very hot. They're cooling through different processes like neutrino cooling when they're 60,000, 70,000 Kelvin stars. Um, I showed white dwarfs in sort of a sweet spot of you know, 20,000, 10,000 Kelvin. They have a thin layer of hydrogen. They're just radiating away stored thermal energy through their ions. When you get to very cool white dwarfs, um, some of the bumps and wiggles that you see in the luminosity function of white dwarfs are caused by um, other effects. So for example, you can get crystallization in the cores of these stars. And that crystallization can produce, uh, can produce a latent heat. And that heat um, ends up slowing down the cooling of these stars. So, for example, to show you an example, there's um, you can see that the, the if you imagine you bend this up and you measure the luminosity function, there's a jump that happens right here, right? There's a steep jump in the luminosity function where you get a lot more stars here than you had just above it. That's caused by crystallization. So we have to account for all of these models when we do the full blown. You know, we don't measure the age using this. We measure the age by simulating the full population putting in all of the white dwarf physics that we know about. And those physics, which are done by my, my theoretical colleagues, uh, you know, account for the various things that you're talking about. <coughs> I just wonder how much uh, model dependence you have here. For example, for the blue hooks, you know, this, it would it depend on the atmosphere, like this clearly induced uh, capacity? Yeah, and in fact, this is one of the outstanding problems that we have. So if you look at the data for both, these are two different star clusters, very different metallicities, completely different dynamical states, other properties. But you see that the cooling sequence looks very similar, and in both cases shows this very sharp hook to the blue at the faint end. <coughs> and so bolometrically, these stars are getting cooler and, and, and dimmer. But in these band passes that we're looking at, that we're studying in these colors, um, you know, the flux is being sort of re-radiated from the red to the blue. If you look at the simulations, the simulations don't actually show that. Uh, the simulations show <coughs> a much more rounded hook, right? It doesn't show the sharp hook to the blue. And so we're concerned about this. And we feel that this is probably telling us that the prescription on maybe the atmospheres of these stars and how much helium pollution you might have in the hydrogen layer or some other piece of input physics is probably missing from the models right now. And so, you know, this is new territory. You know, this, these are the first data sets where we've been able to uncover the complete white dwarf cooling sequence in these very rich stellar populations. And I think the field is still coming up to speed with the data and there are, there are new physics to put in here to get the, you know, to get the, the, the you know, an even better answer. But how large is the like, you know, uncertainty in the age? So this, the uncertainty in the age that I quoted is for a given set of white dwarf models. Um, so the uncertainty that we get here is 0.7 billion years, but that's you know, assuming that set of white dwarf models. If there's some new physics that's missing in those models, then you can get a swing in, in this age. And in fact, uh, when we published our 2005 paper, when we analyzed the, red, the cluster in red, NGC 6397, since we published that paper, and, and today we get a different age because of improvements that were made in the, in the cooling models, and the delta is about a half a gig a year. So the delta in age has changed by about one sigma of the error bar in the last 
you know, five years. So I think we're still learning. The, the important thing here is that if you can get the physics right, it is intrinsically a much more sensitive technique than the main sequence turnoff physics. And then second, the systematics the, that you're talking about, the uncertainties, are completely independent of the uncertainties <coughs> that plague the main sequence uh, turnoff. So <coughs> you, know, you should be able to do both and show that they both agree. You have uh, an empirical uh, initial and uh, mass relation. Uh, that relation consists of two terms. Uh, certainly, uh, the, uh, it does not apply when the initial mass is very small, right? Because of the <coughs> second term, which is uh, <coughs> of the if you, initial mass. Yeah, so, so if you... Go ahead, sorry. I have uh, two questions. The first one is, uh, what is uh, the uh, validity range for the uh, initial mass, so that your relation for the <coughs> final mass uh, will be good? What is the validity? Validity range. Range, range. 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 Ah, yes, 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 of course. Yeah. OK, so. Because, uh, <coughs> if, uh, Initial mass is zero. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. This would not so I would. Yeah. So I would not extrapolate this relation beyond where it's been measured. And so where it's been measured is from zero point eight solar masses to six solar masses, right? Okay. I mean, if you if you put this, if you uh, push this down to brown dwarf masses, you get a 0.4 <laughs> solar mass remnant right. for it, right? It doesn't make sense. Yeah, right. And so only use it over the relation that it's been measured. Now, the relation shows a flattening off, right? That, this is a simple, uh, simple linear fit to the data. But clearly, this relation has a slope in it, right? It looks like it's relaxing at the high mass end, and it's certainly relaxing at the low mass end, right? Okay. And so, so you have to do a more, yeah. you know. You can't actually measure it below 0.8 solar masses because the age of the universe hasn't been long enough for those stars to go through this stage of evolution. So right. Like 0.5 solar masses stars will not burn through their have not burned through their hydrogen yet okay. in the age of the universe. Yeah. So if you had a point, point 0.5 solar mass star that formed right at the Big Bang, mm -hmm. right, that star would still be burning its hydrogen, okay. and it will continue to do so for a long time. Yeah. So uh, is this one uh, is uh, explanation why you know the curve finally uh, become uh, flat? Uh, this? Right, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I mean, this, a, uh, I, mean I think, I, mean, I, I, I think, I think what's going to happen at the, at the very low mass end, so say you have a, uh, say you have two, uh, two stellar populations, they have the same metallicity, they have the same characteristics. The only difference is, in one of them, a star is evolving with a mass of 0.85 solar masses, mm -hmm. and in the other one, a star is evolving with a mass of 0.83 solar masses. So now say you want to figure out, well, what type of white dwarfs are those two stars going to uh, make? I don't think you should use this. I think the delta in the white dwarf mass is probably just going to track the delta in the progenitor mass, and you'll have two one hundredths difference in the progenitor mass. Because it's basically just the core of the star, and, and the processes in the, in the envelope are going to be the same over that short time scale. So at the, at the low mass end, I don't think this is valid. So uh, I had one question about this, the initial and final mass relation. Like when you're looking at a, a cluster, you often see blue straggler stars, which are binary stars, which have, or you know, some, there's been some binary evolution or stellar collisions, which result in a high mass star existing past when it should. And those yeah. things should also turn into white dwarfs. Yeah. So does, does, is that like your dominant uncertainty in what you're doing? But how do you account for that kind of? Uh, yeah. So so um, the initial so the goal of this is to show an initial final mass relation that represents stellar evolution for singly evolved stars. Okay. And so you're right. When we look at the white dwarf cooling sequence, some of the faint blue stars that we see there are white dwarfs that have suffered some type of mass exchange or uh, you know, some kind of you know, binary evolution. And so we see those. So, for example, when we get the spectrum of a white dwarf, we can, I mentioned it's, we can measure its temperature, its, its surface gravity, its age. We can also get its theoretical luminosity, right? Because we know its temperature and its radius. There's a mass radius relation for these stars. And so that uh, theoretical luminosity has to agree with the observed magnitude of the star at the distance of the star cluster. And so for some of our stars, we find coincidentally that, um, that the stars are over luminous by 0.75 magnitudes. 
And so that's telling us that we have a double degenerate. We have two white dwarfs that are unresolved. The spectra is co-adding, and the stars are over-luminous in our photometry. In other cases, we see a theoretical luminosity that's grossly uh, different from what we expect, uh, th than what we know the photometric magnitude of the star is. And so in that cases, in those cases, either it could be a white dwarf that's sitting in the Milky Way disk along the line of sight, but not associated with the star cluster, so it's at a different distance, and we check it out. Or it could be a white dwarf that suffered some type of mass transfer whose clock has been adjusted, and so it's not sitting on the cooling sequence where it should be. And so we see evidence of all of that. We get rid of all of those things, and the only objects that we use are the ones whose uh, theoretical distance agrees with their observed distance. So I have a question about uh, 47 and Tuck. <coughs> so uh, both that and Trizan fiber fermilat sources, um, so they see emission in the GEV band from them. And the idea is that that's coming from sort of a conglomeration of um, millisecond pulsars. So, you know, all local <coughs> clusters like this aren't Fermilat sources, so theoretically that gives you a limit on the population millisecond pulsars of these systems. I'm just wondering if that gives you an additional lever arm and being able to measure the age of these clusters. That's a great question. So I think this is really interesting. So um, you're absolutely right. So 47 Tuck has a lot of low mass X-ray binaries. It has a lot of millisecond pulsars that have been discovered in X-ray and other um, studies. Um, we so so uh, just to put this in perspective. So the, the the study that we did here is one small field with the Hubble Space Telescope on this side of the star cluster. It's like it's probably about the size of that laser pen, All right. right? And so we don't have any type of global mapping of the star cluster or anything like that. Um, I think it would be extremely useful to look for counterparts um, to some of these sources in some of the deep UV and optical imaging that we have in the center of the star cluster. Try and figure out um, you know, whether those stars, which represent the end products of even more massive progenitors in the cluster's history, are, are you know, consistent with what we would predict from an extrapolation of a mass function and things like that. I don't know of any clear case where they're going to tell us something interesting about the age because... Um, you know the 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 the, t the times that you measure for those stars are reflecting their current state and the physical processes that are happening today in those stars, and the the progenitor lifetime of the of the main sequence star is negligible because those stars form from very massive stars that exhaust their hydrogen supply in a right. very small fraction of the age of the cluster. So I don't know whether there's a direct way to use those sources to get an independent constraint on the age of the cluster, but I think they could be very powerful when paired with our Hubble Space Telescope imaging to tell us more about those stars themselves through finding optical counterparts and things like that. All right. Now, well, Fermi GI proposals are coming up, so. <laughs> okay. I might write an email. Yeah, yeah. No, that sounds good. And we have actually, we, um, I, it's not in this talk, but we have a beautiful uh, Hubble Space Telescope ultraviolet mosaic deep image right in the core of the star cluster. Normally, you can't study the cores of these star clusters with Hubble very well because the crowding becomes an issue even for Hubble. So there's too many sources and you hit the confusion limit. But in the ultraviolet, all of these red giant branch stars drop off and the, and the brightest stars that you see are the blue stragglers and the white dwarfs. I'll show you after what the color magnitude diagram looks like. And so I think there's a lot of potential to search that image and overplot all of the X-ray sources, like the low mass X-ray binaries, the millisecond pulsars, and see if there's anything that we could say about the coincidence. So if I understood well, your data suggests that stars between uh, two and three solar masses at their initial mass, <coughs> their, their core requires more mass during the giant phase uh, than the others. <laughs> It suggests that there is something that prevents the growth for smaller massive stars, and there is something else that prevents the growth for more massive stars. Can you explain us what, what would be the reason for, for that competition? Um, so, so the, um, sure, so the, <coughs> so the, the, the physical process that's happening on the thermally pulsating AGB phase is very difficult to model. Um, you know, we don't know um, you know, how the dredge up episodes are occurring. Uh, we don't know what the wind velocities are. We don't know what the opacities are. And so the lifetime of the stars on that phase depend entirely on how long it takes to blow away the stellar envelope. And there's no good theoretical prescription for how that happens. 
And so the, the measurement that we made um, you know, shows us that the core mass grows at about two solar masses by about 30%. And, and, and then it has a shallow tail as you go to uh, more higher mass stars. Let me actually show it to you. Um, So there is no simple picture as to why that is the case. Uh, there's no uh, there's no simple picture as to why that's the case. Um, although, so here's a yeah. So here's sort of the range of predictions that you could get from. That didn't work. Ah, sorry. From theoretical models. On the right hand side. So this is showing the initial mass range over that peak period that you're talking about, two to three solar masses. And on the left is showing how much we measure the core mass to grow as the star goes up the asymptotic giant branch. So that's the black line. And then these things that you see here are different models. Okay, so some of these models predict you know, a core mass growth that's up around you know, 50%. Others predict only 10, 15% at the peak. So, so your question is, you know, loaded in, in the in those physical processes, and I, I would say that we don't know, we don't understand them very well. But I mean, we do observe. It's also related to how much luminosity is emitted by stars of that mass, because that's telling you how much how much helium is being burned and added to the core. And and so that and that we do know that those massive stars have do contribute a large amount of, of luminosity. So this you know this makes sense from a observational point of view from a, a, a different kind of a different perspective. Right, but would you still say that the four solar mass stars shouldn't? Yeah, I mean that they're they're total. If you integrate their luminosity, there will be less. Oh, I less see. Large, less sure. Small fraction. Yep. So the, the black dots on that diagram are observations. Yeah. So the black. So you are able to catch these things in this phase. No. 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 You're not. That's, that's very hard to do, and, and you would have a... It's too quick, huh? It's not too quick. You can see the stars in those spaces, but they're shrouded in dust, and it would be very hard to say, you know, what the actual properties of those stars are. Uh -huh. And so the way that we've done this is, remember that dash line on the initial final mass relation? That tells you the core mass when the star lands on the AGB, and then the white dwarf tells you the core mass at the end, and I just subtract those two. Great, let's thank Jason again. John will be taking Jason to dinner tonight. He will, Jason will also be around tomorrow if you wish to talk to him by email and I'll arrange things.